Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, this afternoon, for our event about data privacy now and in the future. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of William and Mary alumni here to speak with you today, and I think you're going to really enjoy the next hour, which I'm sure will fly by. My name is Roxanne Adler Hickey, and I am the director of the William and Mary Washington Center. This event is one of a series that we are offering this year as a part of our 20th anniversary. We are celebrating 20, 20 years of having a Washington Center. And in those 20 years, while our, our programs and offerings have grown and changed some, um, one thing has remained constant, and that is that we are a place of belonging for the entire William & Mary community. And while we primarily serve students, um, there's a huge growing area of interest among them in all areas of computer science and related fields. So we knew it was gonna be really important to connect with our colleagues in the computer science department and alumni experts as we go into this year and, and beyond. Um, my advancement colleagues like Michael Steelman, who you'll hear from in a second, have been doing this work with alumni for some time. And so coming together today to connect that work with ours allows us to really close the, the loop and, and pull it all together. And some of the magic, if you will, of the Washington Center has been when our faculty and students and alumni and of course staff all come together um, and, and we all benefit. And, and so that is what today is about, a, a showcase of some of our colleagues and some of our alumni um, as just one in a sample of things that the Washington Center does. And um, to that end, let me go ahead and introduce to you um, our partner on today's event, the Director of Alumni Career Management and Professional Networks, my colleague and friend, Michael Steelman. Thank you so much, Roxanne, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it is a pleasure to help celebrate this 20th anniversary of the William Mary Washington Center. Being involved on the Washington Center's advisory board over the past few years has been truly a pleasure, and I'm really excited about the continued growth and engagement fostered by William Mary's campus in DC. When Roxanne first approached me with this idea of this event, I immediately knew which alumni we should ask. Thankfully, Megan, Melody, Jay, and Glenn agreed with enthusiasm. I have had the pleasure of partnering with each of our speakers on different data privacy and cybersecurity events over the past few years, but we have never brought this dream team together for one event. I look forward to hearing their latest perspectives on the changes impacting data privacy today. I'm delighted we are able to have the chair of our William Mary Computer Science Department lead the conversation. The topic of data privacy and cybersecurity is certainly one that will continue to bring our William Mary professionals in this space together on a regular basis. Please don't hesitate to reach out to get more involved on future programming. We welcome your ideas and your engagement. Unfortunately, I have to share that Megan Brown regrets she had a last minute client issue arise and she has to address that today and cannot join us live for this event, but she does hope to join us again in the near future. One quick technology reminder, Professor Michael Lewis will welcome questions throughout the uh, hour from attendees, but you'll use the Q&A icon in the Zoom window to submit your questions. Uh, he will do his best to address as many questions as time allow, uh, probably at the end of his uh, initial questions. Now, uh, Roxanne and I will jump off, uh, turn our cameras off and uh, turn things over to Professor Lewis, and we'll come back at the very end to just conclude a few last minute remarks. Thank you all for joining us. Professor Lewis. Hello, hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm uh, Michael Lewis, I'm the, currently the chair of the Department of Computer Science at William and & Mary. And I should launch a preemptive strike of humility. I'm actually not a, a privacy or security researcher. So um, anything I say that sounds particularly inept, you contribute to that. I would like to also thank the, the, the DC office for setting this thing up and all the work that uh, a lot of people did on it. And I'd like to go around now and introduce our panelists, rather have them say a few things about themselves. Uh, I guess I'll just, uh, if there, there they are. I'll call on them perhaps as they appear. Uh, Jason, would you care to introduce, make some comments? Hey, sure. Uh, my name's Jason. Huh? I'm a JD class of 2012. I'm a compliance counsel at Verizon Business Group, which is a, a operation division within Verizon. And um, I'm speaking in my personal capacity today, but I'm really delighted and thankful for William and Mary uh, to inviting me and being able to celebrate the Washington Center. Thank you. Uh, Melody? Hey, 
Yes, Michael. Hi, everyone. First and foremost, William Mary, class of 98. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today and, and support an event um, put on by the William Mary Center. Um, I am currently the U.S. Head of Cyber Tech Data Change and Resilience Risk at Barclays. Um, Barclays isn't quite a household name in the U.S. It is a U.K.-based bank, um, and, and it's becoming more and more familiar because um, they are the sponsor of the Barclays Center um, out in New, Jer New Jersey. Um, and I've been, um, I guess this part of my career has mostly been in the cybersecurity and tech-related fields. And um, I, I absolutely want to say the same, that my William Mary education was definitely a cornerstone to, to my career, um, which took many paths before I settled on, on the career path I, I ended up on. But I'm really happy to, to be here today. Thank you. And Glenn. Thank you, Michael. And hi, my name is Glenn Ballard. And just want to, first off, thank the, the DC Center for, for hosting us today and the Advancement Organization. If you don't know the DC Center, it's a great organization that William & Mary has. They provide a lot of great content to the industry and they're doing some really incredible things around the intersection of technology, policy, and business. So if you please join future events and look forward to, to continuing the, the, the journey with the DC Center as a, a member of the, the Board of Advisors. Um, a little bit about myself. So I, I graduated undergrad from William & Mary in 2000 with a BBA in information technology and a minor in computer science. And, and I've been, for the past 20 plus years, I've been doing cybersecurity work. So I started off at Accenture in their um, global security program and deploying and implementing cybersecurity solutions for the, for the Fortune 100 commercial clients that they had. I shortly moved over into the federal consulting space and I helped deploy some of the, the large smart card initiatives that the federal government has um, in place on the civilian side of the, the world. And then shortly after moved into uh, federal compliance around cybersecurity and privacy. And, and about 13 years ago, I started my own company, Dragonfly Group, and we are a cybersecurity services firm and initially started with the automation of compliance. And so we help some of our, our clients take a, a 12 month process and move it into a, a five minute um, a process for them. And we've expanded from that and 50% of our work today is in the federal space and 50% of the, the work is in the commercial critical infrastructure. So if you think of the electrical grid, um, nuclear providers, the financial services, healthcare and manufacturing. We are implementing technologies and solutions for those clients to help them meet their, their complex cybersecurity issues that they're facing today. And again, thank you so much for, for having me today. I think um, it, it's an honor to, to be here with the, this audience. Uh, cybersecurity and privacy is such a challenging uh, problem that's facing everyone today and me as a person or, or me as a company is not going to be the thing that solves it. It's going to be all of us partnering together across industries, across uh, education and research um, and, and organizations coming together to, to fix the, the challenges that we face today. So thank you. Thank you. That's actually got a good lead into the first question I'd like to toss out to you all. Um, what, do you, what do you see as the current landscape for data privacy? Well, I, um, I promised to kind of dive in to help my cybersecurity colleagues on the panel have uh, so much additional uh, grounded space to cover. Uh, I, I think for right now, it's, it's, it's the question of a generation. And I think that for generations to come, um, we, prior to this, knew we produced data we knew we used data to make our own decisions, um, but now decisions are being made for us based on the data we create. Uh, now, challenges are emerging that didn't exist before because there's data to talk, you know, to create those problems, but there's also data to create those solutions. I think uh, you look at things like targeted health plans and you know the invent of Apple Music, right? I mean, before record companies would send you their, their CD and say, you can have any songs you'd like as long as it's on this CD. But now you say, no, I want to download the songs I would like, right? That individuation is such a powerful thing. And that was enabled by data 
and data privacy, knowing that data belongs to you and keeps it. But at the same token, if we don't protect that data, and I want to make something really clear too, it's not just our data that's at stake. I think a lot of times when people talk about, oh, I'm not too worried about it, I haven't done anything wrong, um, they're not thinking about the, they don't, they're lacking in richness of imagination, to be honest with you. Um, when I say, are you comfortable sharing your own data with an application that you don't know where it's based from, don't know what they do with it? They say, well, I guess so. I mean, I, I'm going to click the button. How about for your friends and family? Oh, no, no, I'm not into that. But you do it all the time, you know? How, how do you feel about, um, you know, your friends who are intentionally told not to go on social media, right? But they, these apps will create a ghost person for them because they're part of a network and they need to complete an algorithm. Are you okay with that? No. But this is, this is the challenge we're talking about. As Glenn pointed out, we're not in it together. It's not, it's not gonna make the challenge. So protecting that data is so critical. And I think that's where I feel like Glenn and Melody sharing their thoughts about how securing data and securing ourselves in the world through cybersecurity makes data privacy possible. Anyone else care to say something? No, Jay, that's, um, you know, absolutely right. And one of the things that, that come to my mind is with regards to how organizations um, do manage their data. And, you know, when I speak with my, my friends and colleagues outside of the industry, so outside of, you know, the IT and, and cyber worlds, um, I have found that there's a very high level of expectation or assumption, if you will, with regards to how the government or perhaps companies are managing that data. And I think it, it really is a spectrum across which um, how that data is managed and protected in a given organization, uh, not out of pure negligence, but you know, every decision that's made in a company or organization is a risk-based decision. Not a single organization is doing everything um, by the letter perfectly 100% of the time. So there are trade-offs that are made um, with regards to data, how that data is um, managed and architected and governed. There are so many different pieces to um, how we protect data and privacy of individuals and clients and, and organizations that it's, it, it can be very confusing and um, decisions that I think a lot of organizations are still grappling with today or it's a strategy that, that can change um, and has continued to change for a lot of organizations over time. And, and I would add to, to what Melody said. So I, I heard two words that, that she said, that the landscape is a spectrum and that it's confusing. I would, I would add in there, it's, it's a patchwork. So there's, there's different kind of ways organizations are managing their data and the, the privacy data that they hold. And then on top of that, in the, the US, there's, there's no overarching um, way to, to handle privacy data. Um, and, and I believe if, I, if I'm correct, that there's, there's six separate um, verticals of, or actually seven separate verticals of privacy laws that exist today in the US. Six, six of those are state run. So California, Massachusetts, North Dakota, Maryland, Hawaii, and New York. Uh, and then you have other privacy laws that again are, are, are vertical. So you have the, the healthcare privacy law, you have the federal uh, privacy law of 1974, but all of these don't, they're, they're, they work differently and, and very kind of patchwork and confusing. Um, and as a result of that, I think over the last two years, there's been an increase of about 70% of credentials have been um, harvested or hacked into from organizations. And I think the, the, one of the root causes of that is that patchwork of, of policies that exist today. Okay. Um, so sort of, since you brought up the, the, the notion and you know, I think you all said about talking about protecting you know, data, what about the recent executive order? I think uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll start off that one too, if that's all right. I, I think overwhelmingly, it's such a great um, rising to the opportunity, you know, with uh, the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability and the SolarWinds thing that really focused national attention. 
actually, let me rephrase that. Organizational attention got focused with those two, but people's attention got focused with the Colonial Pipeline. Once you started, I mean, it was a kind of almost um, surreal to me, having been in this space for some time, to see that it was a hike in gas prices or taking that away that really got it to be part of like everyday conversation. Um, I spent more times on, I, I just, I don't want to go stretch that point, but I know I'm in a good audience for, for expressing that kind of dissonance. Um, I, the government really said, let's get the federal house in order. Let's set a precedent for what we should do. And then let's make that a model to, to push down and supply America's, um, you know, protect America's data. And I, I think it had a lot of common sense things. Um, you know, section six deals with uh, incident response playbooks. Every agency has their own guidelines about how they should help deal with the data breach. And again, just for the sake of, um, you know, level setting, I consider a data breach when you confirm that data, something happened to data that wasn't supposed to happen to data in an unauthorized way, shown to somebody, whatever. Anyway, um, when it comes, every agency has its own idea of how it should be dealt with. Some might take it in, do an after action report. Some might investigate it by interviewing people on the front line. All that makes it really hard to enforce, makes it really hard to make sure that after every incident, we're doing the things we should be doing. And now giving CISA uh, more opportunity to dig deep and find opportunities to enforce this across is just ample thanks. So long story short, on my end, I think it's a great, um, you know, it doesn't, addressed every challenge, but I don't think it needed to. I think it just needed to hit on some basic points of let's start taking this notion and making it a national priority. So just to um, have a little fun here, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a contrasting view um, or a skeptical view, simply because you know when I when I read the executive order, there wasn't there wasn't a lot that was new as far as actions and instructions and guidance that the government has been putting out for years. Everything from moving to the cloud, I think that was back in 2011 when the first federal CIO came in and made that um, a, a requirement across government to you know, protecting your, 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 inform your information at rest and in transit. All those things have been, um, been requirements right for for any system running government information um, for a while now but one thing that <clears throat> i do like about the executive order that did bring some sense of priority to um, what organizations can focus on um, anything that comes out of the white house in in the area of you know security and privacy is is always a good thing because it gives the level of attention that you know that we need to see more of and i think it's been a while since we've been able to get that level of attention. And I think even um, yesterday, there was a, an update to the, the EO that came out um, just following up on the risks of ransomware, because that's, that's starting to hit, hit mainstream, uh, mainstream uh, news outlets a lot, lot more frequently today. And it is, you know, it's something that organizations need to know how to prepare for. So from that perspective, it's, it's great to see that there's, there's narrowed focus and, and people are talking about it. Um, and certainly with the colonial pipeline attack with people, um, I think more and more Americans experiencing that, um, it really has shown to um, lead to greater action from the highest levels of government. So all those things are, are positive things in the right direction. And, and I would add here that, um, so I, I'm optimistic that it is going to, to help make an impact in, in cybersecurity and privacy. So, so like Jay said, so if you look, I, I wanna say, it, don't quote me on the years, but I say it's 2017, 2018, when there was a large health insurance breach. Um, and then right after that, there was the, the Equifax breach. Um, if you take those, that's private data, that's privacy data. And if you, you take that as an individual, it could drastically hurt you. If you take that, that data coupled with some of the emerging technologies around advanced and, and artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, quantum computing, and, and you couple that with those hacks and provide that to a, a nation state, just think of the impacts that that could and potentially are having to, to the US today. But we didn't, from that, 
we did not see the U.S. citizens or the U.S. population kind of get behind cybersecurity in four to three years ago when that happened. I do think that this, and so we started seeing some, some changes in behavior when it started hitting the, the economics. So we, the, the pipeline, um, the, the recently the, the meat processing and supply chain around food. And I, I see some movement in the, the industry around that. And I think that coupled with the EO is going to, to kind of move things forward and, I, and one of the areas that I think the EO it, or the executive order is different this time is that it, it is hitting the purse strings of the, the US government and the federal agencies. So if you think of the, the buying power of the US government, I, I, I believe last year they spent over 700 billion in procurement and contracts and they had over 11 million contracts that they procured and that those contracts include one to four to 10 different companies that are procured in that cycle. So what you're going to see here is that they've switched the, the, the approach around how to kind of not force or not mandate uh, cybersecurity, but they are using the purse strings of these, these companies to, to make the changes in these these items that should have been done 10 years ago. So the modernization of IT, the threat sharing, um, the doing incident response playbooks, uh, all of that should have been done years and years and years ago. But I think what this has done is flipped it on its head and kind of forcing the industry as a whole to, to start moving because it's going to impact the, the companies and the organizations um, revenue and profits. So that, that makes me ask another question then. I mean, is, is, that, is that the only way to get business to, or government to uh, act? You know, we've had a lot of data breaches. And as you said, they could have really bad consequences for the individual involved whose data they are. But there haven't been so many consequences for the people who are losing this data, right? In, in terms of like the, the Office of Personnel Management uh, hack, you know, tremendous amount of information went out. What, what consequences were there you know, for that? Is, do, you think, do you think now finally it's going to, you know, companies and government are gonna take it more seriously? So I'll start off. So I, I think they absolutely should be, be taking it more seriously. And I would, I would challenge your question and, and reverse it and say that the, maybe it's not the, the consequences of the company themselves. Of course, they need to be protecting the data and they should be following the frameworks and they should be, uh, doing the, the best things that they can for the data that they hold. But maybe it's, it's looking at the, the laws around investigation and litigation and being able to, to take down the, the, the bad actors. So our law enforcement or our defense organizations give them the opportunity or ability to, to take some action on the, the bad players that are out there. I mean, one thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, a lot of times we look at things across people, process, and technologies, and, you know, there, there continues to be a lot of focus on technology, and, and rightfully, right, technology is changing rapidly, constantly, and you need to be able to account for that, um, but if you look at the people, or I, I can look at it in two different ways, and, and part of it is, is certainly the workforce. I mean, studies have been saying for years how, you um, and just how dire the situation is with regards to um, having a skilled and trained workforce that is able to deal with these challenges today. So we are definitely lacking and it's, um, I think the last report I recall reading, I mean, upwards of a, a 2 million person gap with regards to our needs compared to the skills and training that's out there. But then there's also American citizens. I mean, what I also think is, is lacking is really a public service announcement campaign, right? Think back to Smokey the Bear, don't start forest fires, you know, stop, drop and roll, those things that every single person grew up knowing as basic things to protect ourselves and, and our country, right, and our land. Um, what are those basic things that Americans should be thinking about with regard to their data and without, with regards to the things that they are doing themselves and um, the decisions they're making 
um, to protect themselves. And I don't think that that education's out there. And it, it's something that, you know, we're definitely using technology, using our data in ways that is unprecedented. And that conversation needs to start early. And, and that education, I think, is very much lacking. Yeah, and I, I have to, I love that point. And to add to it, I think it goes back to that thing I said earlier about lack of imagination. Um, you know, when I talk about Pokemon Go, people say, well, okay, cool. So are you just trying to flex, Jay, with your, you know, 100 Pokemon? No, no. Let me explain what I'm really trying to get at. That is a app, right, that can motivate real life behavior through made up incentives. The idea that you would, famously, people would walk in traffic or whatever. Um, let's put that aside. Um, they put, there's literally a mechanic called lore mechanic where they, you can set up and have Pokemon, the in-game kind of thing to get the reward system, uh, spawn mysteriously in a ice cream shop, right? And some players are going to go to the ice cream shop and some are not. Now think about what I can do with that knowledge. If I put lures in ice cream shop, this person who, by the way, has their personal tracking device, AKA their phone with them. Um, this person likes ice cream is willing to travel for it. Um, that would change the, the game a little bit about what people uh, are willing to do with, with you know, understand all the data. I think right now they think it's simply in the fraud context and, oh, my bank is really good about stopping bad checks or whatever, so I'm okay. It's that, it's, that's kind of that old framing, like, oh, the way it's been, the trouble I'm having has always been the same and they haven't thought about the other ways data and that's a legal use, right? Think about other illegal uses. Imagine it was used to, um, you know, convince a friend or family that you needed help and you can only reach them by email. That's a, that's a low hanging, that's a very like basic, I would even say caveman example, but there's more sophisticated ways to hack people. And if you need to hack people, you need information to do it. And if the information is being lost, given away and not protected, it's easier for that to happen. And we're the first generation to really struggle with this. And we shouldn't be the last though. And, and then I, I would echo what Melody and Jay just said. There's a huge opportunity for a change of behavior. And, and I can give you a, a little real world example. So we, we as a company are working with our clients to, to deploy security awareness and training internally for their employees. And we, we, we went in and developed a program using uh, augmented reality for some of their system administrators that have privileged accounts and have high access into the data. Um, and we provided almost a game-like function for them to, to see how it would be if they were under an attack. And, and then coupled with that for the awareness across the, the employee base, so regular users that don't have too much access um, to, to data, but are, uh, it, they are, they have phishing attacks against them and they have to, to make sure that they are, are not clicking those links that come in. We, we provided a, a mini series of a, almost a reality TV show that they watched instead of going through a, a click training where you have to, to do a para, PowerPoint and then answer the few questions at the end. And then those two things combined, we saw a 60% decrease in the, the phishing exercise that we performed a few months later. And we saw a 55% decrease in the, the penetration the testing the activities that we performed on their networks. So kind of, it is clearly a, a combination of a technology and business behavior change that, that needs to happen. I was thinking about your comment, Jay, about insufficient imagination. I'm thinking back to when the, the 80s and we started getting on the network and our model, security model was that everyone on the network would be a nice graduate student, right? Something about that, about that level. And I just remember how surprised a lot of us were when we discovered how many antisocial people were out there who were going to use the internet for no good. Um, <laughs> that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> Uh, one question that I have, I want to throw out, because you're, you know, we've, we've talked, I think we've mostly been thinking about uh, bad actors, illegal activity. What about legal activity? And, you know, some, because I've, I've been curious to sort of say, you know, with something like the European uh, GDPR work in the United States, 
particularly given its impact on a lot of business models. I kind of want to give Melody and Glenn a first shot, but I'm, if, I'm at, okay, I'll, I feel bad. I'll, I'll just quickly say this. I think GDPR made a lot of sense. When you asked about a kind of international awakening, when they came to the idea that, yeah, data about me online should be accurate. And if it's not, it's hurting me in some way, it should be stopped. And if a company collects my data, it should be obligated to protect that data. And if they give it to some contractor, that contractor should be obligated to protect it. It all sounds very common sense, but GDPR is really the first time that's been done in a kind of holistic across the board way. Um, you know, kind of indifference, to, slightly different from the patchwork that we heard about. Uh, I think that needs reevaluation. You know, um, the idea that the company or organization that collects your data is obligated to protect it, I don't see why it shouldn't be a legal requirement. Um, it just seems like something natural, and if considering the great power that organizations have, um, they're spending full time doing something with your data. They should be obligated to spend a little bit of that time protecting it too. And, I think there's a lot, there's a big appetite for that in industry, um, in, in government, because and everyone in government gets data privacy, like you mentioned, that OPM hack, right? All their data has been lost, so they get it. Commercial sector gets it for the reasons we talked about. So now let's just get the national awakening going. I think GDPR really shows if they get it, we should be less numb to it. I think we feel some numbness and that. And anyway, uh, that's, I think there's a lot of appetite for it. And I think it would go a long way towards getting where we want to be. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question, Michael. Um, GDPR um, was, was, was landmark, right? And it's certainly the, the one everyone looks to when you think about privacy legislation, data protection. Um, you know, regulation's expensive, right? Bottom line, it's very costly. And I think for many years in the US, you've seen a lot of um, a lot of rejection of moving that direction, but certainly I think the dialogue has changed. And as, as Glenn mentioned, right, more and more states are standing up their own um, pri privacy legislation and it's making things more difficult. And I think the appetite for a, a national um, regulation is, is um, certainly higher than it was before. But, you know, would that work in the US? It's still an open question in my mind because GDPR was written for, for Europeans. And Americans are not Europeans. It's you know there's there's a long history in Europe as to why the regulation became necessary, and there was you know wide support for it, you know dating back to the Holocaust and even before. So I think some of those wounds were are, are still very very much a reality today. With with and you, you see that across um, you know, legislature in Europe. Um, in the U.S., do, do Americans feel the same pain with regards to our identity and, and how it's being used or could be used by the government is, is the same? You know, do we see that level of distrust in, in government? I, I don't know that it's, you know, that we can compare and say that GDPR would work in the U.S. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to get a sense for, I think it's changing the way, the way people feel about their data. And I've even heard you know, I don't, I don't, this is all anecdotal data, but, you know, I've heard where you had the younger generation, maybe millennials that were very um, open to sharing data and, um, but then I heard it was starting to shift with the, the, the most recent generation where, you know, they had become smarter about um, protecting some of the information they put out on the internet, just looking back on, you know, some of what um, the millennials had done and, and learned from. And so, you know, I think there's ways of, of reaction that we're seeing amongst um, Americans through the generations. So I don't know that. I think the jury's still out. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree. And, and as a, a technologist, I don't think I can answer this question. So um, the, there's, but what I can do is provide a little bit of insight on what we're seeing in our clients in that, like I said previously, there's a patchwork of privacy laws in the U.S. and across the, uh, the globe. And so our clients are are always challenged with the, that kind of piecemeal together of those privacy laws and making sure that they are compliant with them. But what we do see is our clients trying to move towards the, the highest watermark in those privacy laws. So they're reviewing the, the, each of the state's uh, laws, they're reviewing the GDPR laws, they're 
reviewing the Latin American privacy laws. And, and even though they do not have to, some of them do not have to comply with those laws, they are trying to, to meet that high watermark. And so I, I will say that there's movement to that. I don't know if regulation or, or law is the answer, um, but, uh, I, but something does need to happen to, to move the, the kind of the privacy needle forward. And, and from, if you were looking at it from a, a non-legal or regulatory approach, you could, you could see that there, there needs to be a balance or a tr like a try balance between the, the businesses making sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, and the, the, the second piece of that is that us as consumers to meet, need to be more active in what we provide and what we agree to. And even though the, 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 agree, the privacy agreements are cumbersome and, and hard to consume, uh, if you are pro providing any type of financial or personal data, you should be reading those. Um, and, and, cons and accepting or, or not accepting those and making that balance in your life on if this is worth it or, or not. And then third, I would say the, the other um, kind of person or organizations that need to, to be aware of this is, are the application developers. And so um, teaching our students to, to make sure that they are building these applications in, in a way that is only using the, the data that is needed for those application and making sure that they are, 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 are building these applications in an ethical way and secure way. So they could be, the, what we've seen previously for the last 20, 25 years is that application developers and organizations are trying to get their applications out as fast as possible. And so the, the items that fall to the wayside are the security coding of, of those applications, are the data protection in those applications. And so if we kind of switch that, that a, a bit and make it more balanced, then the, it's not the, the, the purchaser that's finding those vulnerabilities anymore. It is the, the designers of those applications, the, the, the coders of, of the, 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 the capability is now kind of ha owns part of that risk in that model. Sort of, sort of a, 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 a you know a related question I have because I'm just kind of curious to see what, what you all think. Um, is there you know, is there some way we can actually I don't know, either through regulation or some other set of conventions limit what you know have, have kind of standardized limits on what companies can do with data because I'm thinking for example uh, recently the uh, uh, Biden administration was making noises about getting uh, non-governmental agents to do surveillance online to get around that sort of, sort of pesky Fourth Amendment stuff. How can we sort of control that kind of activity where you don't have, you have no idea how your data could be, end up being used, even things that are benign, that are public, but they could still be monitored? Hmm. I, I'll take a crack at it, but I, I think this is my first time I've really thought about you know, at the one hand, we got to balance the innovation, right? Not, it's it's kind of like when you write something into law, then it stays, you know, it kind of stays persistent and it might cap something that the way it's being interpreted kind of puts a dampener on things that we want to see more of. Um, I think about uh, advertising technology, you know, they, some people really love the, behavioral marketing and having something put into them. But as a regulator standing aside, you might say, I don't know. They collect a lot, a lot of my preferences, tastes. They kind of put me in a category of a, a type of person that feels a little alienating. Um, I think at, at a, some, you have anything you're comfortable with a good government doing, you have to be okay with a bad government doing. Um, that's a fundamental rule, I think. And I think when we limit the ability for, let's say, collecting uh, information of people needing legal advice or help at, at a bar association, I mean, we would never do it that minimal, but you could see where that's kind of bumps up. And so I like the idea of limiting protection, I think st stays because that, no matter what mechanism is done for, I think it just, 
a fundamental responsibility and it covers no matter what you do. Whereas what, you know, what to do with it once you get it, I think there's other, other than the obvious things that we would say no to, I worry about how that would be executed. So I'll stop there. I mean, it's, it's a challenging one, I think, right? Anyone who is a steward of data has, has a responsibility, right? To be thoughtful about how you use it. And I think back to 20 plus years ago and, you know, the way data was passed around um, between individuals or, you know, a development team that's testing data using, um, using live customer data to um, run, run test programs. You know, I don't know that, um, that was something that was first of mind, you know, but we've come a long way today with regards to, okay, what are the basic attributes that are, that are necessary to test, test functionality, right? And to go through your test cases, you know, being mindful of that, um, ensuring that um, there is transparency with um, what data is needed, how it's being used, um, and, and not taking more than is necessary is, is a responsibility of, of any, anyone, any organization that, that has it. And that can be really hard to manage and control within an organization because it's, um, it's not something that can really be centrally managed. And there's a lot of um, responsibility that, that falls on individuals. So that goes back to, again, the training as well as you know, having um, the right tools and processes in place to um, execute in that way. Um, you think about some people have been doing this for a long time, it, it's a complete change in mindset and, and also in, in, in practice for how, how you execute a function. Um, but if that education isn't there, if, if, if someone hasn't had that continual um, education on, on how to protect data over the years, you could have someone who's your best you know, data software or sorry, software developer out there and, and not, not understand. And, and so, and, and not be doing, um, taking that responsibility seriously. So um, those are things you have to look out for. And again, having a skilled and trained workforce is, is, is important for those reasons. And, and I agree. And I think the kind of another approach to take is, is looking at data and, and, and prioritizing it and kind of and looking at it at the, the risk level to say, what is the risk of holding healthcare data versus financial data versus other type of control data as well. And, and so there's different kind of frameworks that you could put around different types of, of risk profiles of, of that data. And, and, and like Melody says, I think one of the, the solutions is, the, is kind of pushing those decisions down to, to the, the users and the creators of that data, which will require some type of ch behavioral changes and some type of user-friendly um, technology that they could have at their, their ability to classify that data through the life cycle of the data. Uh, and then another thing that, that could potentially help or that we're, we're also seeing not only just in a, a privacy standpoint, but from a security standpoint is there, there's the, the possibility of um, doing micro segmentation around the data. So making sure that you have your, you, you identify the high value assets and the high value data that you're holding within your organization and, and doing uh, micro segmentation around that, to put higher controls and security into to, to, to safeguard that, that data that you have. Um, and then kind of even like a bigger picture and across different industries, there's also the opportunity of segmentation of the, the networks and, and data that's flowing. So if you look at the Colonial Pipeline hack that, that just happened, it was a hack on their, their IT organization, but because they're the, or ransomware on the, the IT organization that directly impacted their OT, so their operational technology environment. And they made a decision to turn off the OT uh, um, environment because of the, the risk of the, that, that um, ransomware traversing into the OT environment. And so clearly there's some type of connection today that they have across their networks. But if they, that, if they had a segmentation of their IT environment 
versus their OT environment in separate networks, then that would be a solution or a, a mit mitigation to some of the, the issues that we're seeing across these, these large scale um, attacks on organizations. Why, why do you think there's not more of that kind of segmentation already? I, mean, I always marvel when I hear some of the things that people put on networks or sort of public networks. And I think, why would you want to, you know, there must be a better way to do it than that. Yeah, so I think, I think it's a couple of things. I think one is, it, it goes back to this kind of similar conversations we've been having. It's um, user experience. So people want to, to, to have the, the best user experience that they have based on the technology and infrastructure that they already have in place. And ways to do that is just building off of the foundation that they already have to, today. Um, the, the other um, reason why I, I think organizations are doing that is that there's, uh, back to my point previously, is that they, they're trying to get their software products or their applications out to market quickly. They're trying to, to build their internal capabilities quickly. And as a result of that, why not just build off of the, the, the networks that, that you have today? Um, and, and then lastly, again, I think it's just the, the lack of understanding and, and knowledge of the, the impact and the, the risk of the, the compromise of the data that they have today. Just to build on that, if I can, um, Michael, you said, you know, why are they putting this stuff on the public internet? And I think that's that's some of the uh, what people don't realize. I think companies are pre generally pretty good at, at not doing that, right? Especially your control systems that are within your operational technology. But what you what you have is people build their network infrastructure. You know, it's kind of like the the M and M analogy, right? It has this hard hard shell on the outside, but everything inside is all mush, right? So. What you have is you have your IT network and your OT network and someone gets in through the public internet, whether it's through a phishing email or something, but then what they, they do what we call lateral movement. So the bad actors will navigate through your, your messy network and find that vulnerability allows them to cross over to the other network. I mean, there was a time when when it just there was no connection, but to Glenn's point, these new tools are coming in that provide the this you know provide the operator the ability to monitor their pipeline from home, <laughs> and that sounds really good to the guy who's responsible for for purchasing that that new new capability. Um, and it's just um, you know there needs to be more accountability on those manufacturers. I mean that's absolutely a big part of it. It's part it's third party supply chain. Um, risks that um, that we rely upon. I think our critical infrastructure. There's there's such reliance on on the the private sector and on these industrial manufacturers, and they aren't being held to account to to build in security and require it. Security is still an add-on for a lot of these tools, and it's it's opening up holes in our infrastructure, and we're we're hearing about it every day. Okay. I was, I was I was checking up the Q and A. If you do have questions, up oh, there is a there is a uh, a question in the in the Q and A. Let's see. When do you think people will feel comfortable using Web three point privacy enhancing technology? So in the examples here are zk snarks, which I'm not familiar with, decentralized data storage, etc. So from the, I'll take a, a quick stab at this one. So the, we're seeing organizations decentralizing data today. So the, the, this is one of the, one of, kind of many solutions to the, the ransomware um, issues that, that organizations are facing today. And so we're seeing organizations move rapidly to this. So they're having hot backup sites, but also having separate databases and, and data just of the, the content and data of their their um, their kind of critical assets and, and infrastructure. So I think we're seeing more movement to this. Um, we're also seeing a lot more of uh, automation and inventories of assets. And so we're seeing a huge push across our, our clients today to get a better understanding of the assets that they have today. So not only just their hardware assets, but their data assets as well. So 
they're, they're putting large scale data analytics and heuristics around their networks to, to be able to monitor, identify, and make sure that they, they know what they have on their networks. And uh, I think the decentralization piece, you know, kind of, I try to relate to people that you already kind of do that already. You know, oh, do you have all your photos in one album? No, you put in multiple albums. You have them on your hard drive. You have them on your phone. And yeah, they may not all be um, mirrored, but you, if you need photos of yourself for LinkedIn or whatever, you can find it. I think um, there's, a, I think that makes sense inherently to managers who may not feel like this is all over their head. Um, but being resourceful, I think a lot of organizations like that. I think they also like the idea of being able to scale down multiple, like these big, big cloud storage contracts that have one vendor and be able to sign up for a few and compare and get better deals. You know, so-and-so is giving me really good security and I'm paying less, but I never would have thought to check that until I tried to diversify the places I store data. So it has a lot of benefits for managers. And I always recommend if you're a decision maker, um, you know, who has to care about the purse strings, it, this is a two for one deal. Uh, protecting your data and putting it in different places uh, lets you also get good deals from vendors on uh, how they provide it. So just a thought. I mean, another, I think, related thread to that is, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, why do we need to keep giving companies our data? Why is that necessary, right? We, we should decentralize identity and we should be responsible for our own identity instead of giving that to every single person we want to transact with. I mean, you know, Apple Wallet is a good example of how they've tried to um, try to take that away so you don't have to um, give your data over to companies to transact with them. Um, but, you know, think about all the different use cases we have where we're giving so much information about ourselves just to buy something. And so, you know, what are the, those models where, you know, we, we take more ownership of, of our information and um, no longer have to um, hand it over um, and then be subject to data breaches when, when things go wrong. I mean, that's, there's a lot of, um, I think, movement and in, in moving in that direction, a um, lot, of, lot of debate anyway. So more of an on-demand model. But not, not to hijack it, but I, I remember when we were preparing for this that Glenn had some thoughts on identity management that I'd yes. love to do. So yeah. I didn't mean to take that away from you. I just got no, excited. No, 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 no. I was, I was about to get to it. <laughs> get to it. But yeah, that is a, since we're talking about identity, uh, identity management. The issue yeah, that so so I, I, th I think this... Uh, authentication and identity management is one of the, the big pieces of the puzzle to, to solve um, both the privacy issues or challenges and cybersecurity um, challenges as well. So the, the stronger identity proofing that you have, the, the, the better you as, a, as a, a person and as a consumer of goods will have the ability to, to manage your identity and the privacy data that you are are providing to, to different organizations. And, and you'll see that um, there, there's, there's, there was some work that, was, that happened in, in about 2005, 2006 that the federal government uh, initiated, which was, the, it was called the e-authentication uh, um, approach and the, uh, the HSPD 12, so Homeland Security Presidential Directive number 12, where they were putting decentralization and federation of identities. And, and what they were they're doing is that as a, a provider of a technology or a solution, they were outsourcing the identity proofing to organizations that were really good at it. So if you think of a, a, a large bank, they would, they would be very good at identity proofing or the, their organizations and, um, to, to a level of a sensitive application that somebody needed to get into. Um, but then if you looked at a, an organization such as a Facebook or a, a, a email provider, they would be okay at doing some type of identity proofing for a lower level risk application. And so there's opportunities for the, the both the private sector and public sector to work together in identity proofing and, and making sure that our, our identities are managed properly and, 
and can be um, authenticated and authorized across applications properly. Ooh, I see, actually, we're, we're, we're down to our last five minutes. Um, I'll just throw it open to you all. If there's, oh, we have a question here. Curious to hear expert thoughts on Apple versus Facebook privacy war. <laughs> I, and, I mean, I, I think the, I'll just, I'll just be a little more general. You know, when you got friends who work all over, you don't want to put them in a, uh, in a different way. Uh, one thing I'll say is Lawfare is my favorite blog to read. It's if you're, I'm a political science person by training. So if you, I love that blog and had some great hot takes that I think are worth considering. Um, but I'll just say, I'll say one thing that, um, you know, at, at the, the need for data is intense. And I like the requirement where if I collect your data for a purpose, I should hold to that purpose. And if I'm gonna change or wanna add a purpose, I need to kind of get your permission again. I think that's a fundamental piece. If I asked you, can I borrow, you know, your car? You say, sure. And then I say, hey, by the way, I let, your, I let my neighbor borrow your car. You'd be like, that's not okay. But we do it with data all the time, uh, you know? And I think that the government and, and GDPR now finally, they say, no, we're not gonna do that. Uh, and I think CCPA tried to get at that too, as long as the Virginia law. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think fundamentally, when we have a, a, a literal um, community of data and we start to work with each other, it's much better when it's mutually agreed as opposed to one person decides the other one is like the host for a symbiote, you know? <laughs> I'll just leave it that way. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into this fight. Um, and so I'm not gonna answer, but I do think we should have a follow on conversation with this and invite Jane Horvath, who is a, a William and Mary graduate and a, Chief Privacy Officer for Apple. I'm sure she would she would have so, some say in this. <laughs> I mean, it's similarly, right? I mean, you could argue they're both right, but you know, they're both taking positions that that align with how each each company makes money, right? So it's you could take it further. It is a philosophical debate, but you know, their interests line in, you know, align with you know how they make money, and so you have to take it with a grain of salt and with regards to who and how to follow, you know, this debate. But it's, I think it's at the core of really a lot of the questions that we've raised today around, you know, is America ready for a national, you know, privacy regulation? And, you know, this is, this is really at the center of, of, of that dialogue. Ooh, there's one more good question in the, um, there was a good question in the uh, Q and A. We have two minutes, we'll see if we can do this. Someone asked if blockchain can play a role in data privacy insofar as uh, in terms of portability of individual data. So I, I'll take a quick stab. So I th absolutely. So I think it, it will play both a, a portion of privacy and cybersecurity. So in privacy, it goes back to identity proofing, but it, and so you will have the ability to monitor where your, your identity goes, um, but also data proofing. So you'll know what pieces of data um, are, are connected to you versus um, someone else. So there's absolute opportunity there. Um, there's also opportunity in the cybersecurity world. So if you think of the ransomware attacks that happened today, the, the kind of the last step of that is the, the potential ransom payment uh, to those organizations. And, and uh, there's kind of 50% say you should pay, 50% say you should not pay. Uh, and so I don't know what the answer is there, um, but the but if, you, if we kind of reimagined how that worked, um, cryptocurrency is built off of blockchain. So if we were able to, to build transparency into those, those payments in the cryptocurrency model and world, then our law enforcement and our defense organizations would be e easily able to identify the, the bad actors and potentially for, um, go after them for litigation and legal options. It's a great question. Okay, looks like we're at the end of time. So let me let me. I'd like to thank our, our panelists. There was a very lively and informative discussion. Well, and, and Professor Lewis, thank you uh, first off for for moderating this and, and helping make this possible. Uh, I want to echo 
thank you to Melody, Glenn, and Jay. And thank you, Megan, for uh, helping create this event. We hope to, I think we definitely have some topic areas for future discussion that came in those last two questions. So there's no uh, doubt that we have more to come on this. Um, and so we're going to put a couple links in the chat. Elizabeth is going to do that. That are ways to get involved, both with the programs that we're doing like professional programming uh, to connect with fellow alumni in your area of industry expertise, as well as getting involved with the 20th anniversary of the Washington Center celebration and beyond. If you have internships or opportunities to hire students in any capacity, we have great need in that as an ongoing uh, effort that Roxanne, I can see her nodding probably hopefully uh, on this. And so um, with that, I just will turn it over to Roxanne to say a few closing remarks, but thank you all again. We hope to see you at future events throughout the summer and stay involved and hopefully sometime in the near future in person uh, in DC and around the country. So thank you so much. That's exactly right, Michael. And so Melody, Glenn, Jay, and Michael, thank you. Thank you for giving us your time this afternoon and your expertise. Um, I love when our community comes together like this, especially on important topics. And we need alumni like you who engage and, and continue to teach us. And so for all of you who participated or, or watch this now or in the future, thank you. Um, and like Michael said, all, all the links to join are there. But thank you. Thank you all for being a part of this and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank Happy you. 20th Washington Center. Bye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> to all of us. Bye. <laughs> yes, right.